Kingdom are getting a whopper of an admission from Burger King, the fast food giant admitting the presence of horse meat in their food after weeks of denial. From the Burger food giant King's Bird's Eye and two of its ready meals example, to contaminated ground beef at the Mexican the food chain Taco Bell. Illegal horse meat trafficking ring detaining nearly 30 people from seven different countries, including the Netherlands, Belgium, Britain, Germany and France. The arrests come two years after horse meat was found being passed off as... In which samples of ground meat sold online in the United States were found to contain horse meat DNA, raising a frightening question. Might horse meat be in our food supply? Spring of 2013, meatballs served in the restaurants at IKEA stores in Europe were found to contain an unadvertised ingredient, horse meat. But the problem wasn't just IKEA's. Within a short period of time, it was discovered there were other global companies selling beef products containing up to 40% horse meat. Europe's Horsegate, as it became known, shocked an unsuspecting public around the world but didn't shock those in horse-related industries. That's because those working in horse racing, rodeo, and ranching are privy to a disturbing underground pipeline of which most of mainstream society is still completely unaware. We were not surprised. Horse meat sales were going down. Horse meat became cheaper than beef, so it becomes beef. There was discovered that what was expected to be other kinds of meat, like beef, was actually horse meat. and the issue raised you know, a greater concern about where is the meat actually going and how's it being labeled. We tested easily for about 100 companies, um, some from very small to major chains. Pretty much every large company that you heard in the news. There is so much that goes on with the food system that people just don't know about. Um, when you have a processing plant that sends out meat, and then that goes to another distribution center, and then another distribution center, and on from there, there are so many hands that touch that shipment. I think a lot of it is intentional. The panic ensuing from the scandal stemmed not only from an ethical concern for those who prefer not to eat horse meat, but also a food safety concern. These horses uh, have been doped with all kinds of uh, concoctions. The idea that that same horse then would be sold off and put into a food supply creates a tremendous concern on my part. The European public is not aware that much of the horse meat that they consume, either knowingly or unknowingly, comes from North American horses. About total 20% of all horse meat consumed in Europe in the European Union is from North America. Most of that comes from U.S. horses that are shipped to either Canada or Mexico. But unlike in Europe and the United States, horses are not raised for human consumption. So if American horses are providing up to 20% of the horse meat in Europe, where is the meat coming from? The horse industry, the racing industry, you know, part of their business model is they breed horses, they run them. If they don't make money, they're out the door. The specialty breeders, 
the racing community, all of these communities are essentially using uh, horse slaughter as a safety valve to continue their irresponsible practices of overbreeding. Each year on average, about 130,000 discarded American horses are sold at auctions to kill buyers, crossing the borders into Canada and Mexico to be slaughtered in European Union approved processing facilities to satisfy an international demand for horse meat. 70% of slaughtered horses are quarter horses, oh, and I think 15 to 19% are thoroughbreds, and the rest are mixed breeds, um, a lot of large draft horses, which bring them a lot of money. You know, the second that that horse's value or uh, economic um, value to them declines, that horse is given away. They know they have a business model that gets rid of horses, and they know that there's a slaughter pipeline. They've never been held accountable for it. A large percentage of these horses are quarter horses and thoroughbreds, with origins in racing, rodeo, and other equestrian activities. However, a notable percentage of horses comes to slaughter through another means. So roundups, you know, are not sexy. They're not Marlboro ads. I mean, these horses are running for their lives. The Bureau of Land Management states that these roundups are necessary to control a wild horse population, which totals more than 50,000 horses. Horses are usually chased by helicopter, driving the herds to an area where they are then gathered and assessed. After the animals are captured, then they are transported to short-term holding corrals to be prepared for adoption. And that's where the animals are vaccinated, dewormed, they receive a freeze mark, and then they're offered to the general public for adoption. Those animals that are younger are maintained at the corrals. Those that are older and not as suitable for adoption are transported off to long-term holding pastures, which are private lands uh, rented by the government where these animals will live out the rest of their lives. While the Bureau of Land Management prohibits those adopting wild horses from selling the animals for slaughter or bucking stock, some say these conditions are difficult to enforce and expire after one year. So upon application for title, then those conditions met, BLM will transfer ownership to that wild horse and burrow to the adopter and it becomes private property. But still, many do fall through the cracks. Land management oversees 245 million acres of our public lands. Out of that, 155 million acres have livestock grazing on them. And out of that, there are 26.9 million acres of BLM herd management areas. But critics of the wild horse and burrow management program say that far too much forage is allocated to livestock grazing and not enough to wild horses. On the wild horse herd areas, livestock are allocated 82.5% of the forage, while forage allocated to wild horses is 17.5%. So if you just do the math, you can see that the horses are given such a small piece of the American pie, yet this country was built on their backs. While horses captured by the Bureau of Land Management on BLM-managed areas are not to be sold for slaughter. The same protections don't exist for horses on the lands not overseen by the BLM. When the American public thinks of free roaming horses, they automatically turn their minds to the Bureau of Land Management. BLM only manages horses that roam public lands 
that are protected by the Wild Horse and Burrow Act. We have no jurisdiction, no responsibility whatsoever for free roaming horses that roam tribal lands or any other ownership. In fact, a number of Native American tribes do conduct roundups to capture and then sell horses, often for the purpose of slaughter. Up until recently, the Navajo Nation was among them. We sell the horses in lots. And we used to get anywhere between 50, 60, even up to $70 a head for these horses. The roundups have always been part of the, the overall scope of land management. Once upon a time, we weren't confined to the 27,000 square mile reservation that we're confined to now. We managed our herds, our land, and we, in a way that followed the vegetation. Now we're stationary. Now we live in one place year round. And that has created a situation where our animals have become, have come to the point where they overgraze. And we have to learn how to manage our land because we can't move like we used to before to go where the land's more fertile. Each feral horse drinks between five and 10 gallons of water a day. They eat anywhere between 8 to 18 pounds of forage a day. Their livestock that is on the Navajo Nation and responsibly cared for are competing with feral horses, wild horses, and other animals for water and vegetation. So they've made a case against the horse. And the propaganda against America's wild horses has been consistent for decades. And that is why we can't shake it. It's, it's, it's sort of built into a ranching culture out there that has a competing interest in that, in that territory. It's a bullet to the head of the horse. Whether from the racetrack, the roundup, or another source, the slaughter pipeline begins with the sale of the horse, most frequently at a livestock auction. Horses that end up in kill pens at auctions around the United States come from a variety of sources. A North American horse goes to slaughter through a kill buy who will have a contract with a slaughterhouse. Um, the slaughterhouse will, will, will give out these contracts to satisfy the demand for the horse meat they have at the slaughterhouse end. So this is a very much a demand-driven business. So here's how it works. Meat distribution companies will contact slaughterhouses to let them know that they have a demand for horse meat. The slaughterhouses will notify kill buyers, and the kill buyers will go to auction to purchase horses. The kill buyers will bring many of the horses to a feedlot to increase weight, then deliver them to the slaughterhouse to be killed. The slaughterhouse then delivers the meat to the distributor, which delivers the meat to the customers who initially placed the order. The entire pipeline stems from demand, not from a surplus of unwanted horses. Um, they'll, they'll pick up these horses for maybe 100 bucks a head. Race horses are actually quite attractive to them because they have good body condition coming off the track. Auctions vary, but nearly all of them present the horse with a confusing experience, as an animal which has been trained to trust humans is now betrayed by that training and treated as livestock. I think with, with these types of auctions, um, horses at these auctions, they are now livestock. They've gone from being a sports animal, a companion animal, a pet, uh, or a work animal, which is kind of what, what they've been doing in the past, to becoming livestock by entering those auctions. They, they're loose in pens, then they're herded through and treated like livestock. So, you know, if the horse doesn't move forward, then someone's behind it chasing it and whatever, just like they would a cow or a pig or, or something like that. So that sort of, the way we treated that horse over the years of its life is, is gone. This is Big Red. Like all too many former racehorses, he found himself at a livestock auction in July of 2014, up for sale. Because all American thoroughbreds that race are tattooed under their lip, Big Red's racing career was easy to track down using this number. Big Red was bred in Illinois, born on March 24, 2000. Red's 25 races 
show a career which earned about $65,000 for his owners over his two-year racing career. The record shows that he changed hands three times, until, in 2004, his racing career appears to have ended. How Big Red, ten years later, ended up at one of the nation's most notorious livestock auctions is a mystery, but end here he did, where he likely had an experience similar to most horses in his situation. Big Red, like many others, was available for bids from anyone, and it is often the case that other individuals aside from the kill buyer place bids in an attempt to purchase the horse, but eventually lose in the bidding process. The kill buyer will bid on the horses he wants, pile the horses onto a truck, and haul the animals away. This next step in the pipeline is fraught with terror for the horse. The uh, incentive is to fit as many horses as possible onto a trailer to make the most profit from each load. So horses that are scooped up and collected from a variety of sources, from a variety of owners who don't know each other, are crammed as tightly as possible into these trailers. Horses have an immediate uh, response to establish a pecking order, and so what happens is that the more aggressive horses will start to fight and bite and kick the more docile ones. This often results in serious and perhaps fatal injuries to horses. In fact, quite often uh, horses that are weaker will fall and become trampled to death and arrive dead on arrival. It's not uncommon for this to happen. The USDA documented hundreds of violations of the Humane Transport to Slaughter Act for horses when the plants were here in the United States. Huge gaping wounds, eyes missing from horses, or dangling by a thread, um, horses dead on arrival. The horse's destination from this journey may be the slaughterhouse directly, in which case the animal might be killed in only a few days. But sometimes horses go to feed lots, where they often stay for months, in an attempt to fatten them up and increase the profit margin for the value of their meat. So when these horses are purchased either from auctions or from roundups or whatever that is, they'll then go to a feedlot, spend probably 120 days plus on feed, and then they would go to, to the, the packing plant. That's actually what's currently really happening in this country already. Most horses are going to a feedlot before they go to Canada or down to Mexico. This pipeline, from auction to slaughter, is one that repeats itself dozens of times every week throughout the United States. Across the nation, there are nearly 100 livestock auctions at which horses are sold, as frequently as once a week. At least half of these supply a significant number of horses to kill buyers. Since these horses are intended for human consumption, a market which is driven by overseas interests, many of the largest feedlots in the United States where horses will find themselves, are owned and operated by international companies. These companies then transport the horses up to Canada, down to Mexico, or occasionally to Japan, for slaughter in approved facilities, which then package and sell the meat to distributors, who then distribute to the European or Asian market. While horses destined for slaughter in North America suffer the transport of the livestock trucks, horses that travel to Japan will be packed into small crates to endure the wretched 15-hour journey by flight. Upon arriving in Japan, they will be slaughtered and prepared for a number of delicacies, such as full sashimi, Prior to 2007, there were three main horse slaughter facilities operating on U.S. soil. U.S. tax dollars ensured that these facilities enjoyed oversight from the USDA to approve the processed meat for distribution for human consumption. The last three horse slaughter plants that operated in the United States were closed by state action. That left the door open for horse slaughter operations to start up in other states. 
So Congress decided to defund the use of taxpayer dollars for USDA horse slaughter plant inspections. I happened to come from the state of Texas in which two of the last three processing plants were located, one in Illinois, two in Texas, and suddenly I was thrust right in the middle of this effort, political effort, to ban them. And I kept saying, why? And eventually, uh, you know, they won. This did not make the plants illegal, however, and there is still no federal legislation in the U.S. that prohibits the industrialized slaughter of horses for human consumption. But the defunding made it impossible for the plants to operate only as long as each annual federal budget continued to include the language prohibiting U.S. tax dollars to provide funding for horse slaughter facility inspections. The defunding language was approved again in 2008, 2009, 2010, and 2011. But a push from lobbyists and politicians advocating for horse slaughter eventually restored the funding language for the annual budget of 2012. Beginning in 2012, the Congressional Agriculture Appropriations Committee removed the language which defunded USDA inspections, which means that from 2012 on, the funds were available for USDA to inspect horse slaughter plants. Once the funds were again available, at least six facilities submitted applications to the USDA to receive grants of inspection for horses slaughtered for human consumption. Valley Meats in Roswell, New Mexico was one of them. Well, this is, uh, this here is our knocking chute. This is where livestock, cattle, horses, whatever we're slaughtering, we walk them into this area here. And then this is where the actual stunning process begins. That's the pneumatic stunner up there. Then we skin out the hind legs. We open up the brisket. The inspector checks inside this saw here. We, can, we use it to uh, split the carcass right down the middle and we push it over to the wash station. We have employees on either side of this table, either to vacuum pack, to grind, to package, to put in boxes or, or into the cooler, depending on if we're shipping it fresh or frozen. Uh, we, we've been at this slaughterhouse slaughtering cattle for 22 years. When uh, the recession hit here in, uh, in, well, I guess not just in New Mexico, throughout the country, uh, we, uh, well, we took, it, took a hard hit with the cattle. And we even had some of our, dairy, our dairies here in the valley that started moving into Texas. And so it, it took a lot of cows away that, that we were slaughtering here. And so when the opportunity came up that, you know, that we could slaughter horses, uh, it, immediately it was a no-brainer. We, we thought, we, we can do this. We sure can. The USDA requires for slaughterhouses wanting to process horses to undergo modifications and then to reapply as a horse slaughter facility. We applied with USDA first and everything was moving along as planned. USDA is helping us. And then in April of 2012, uh, the news breaks that Valley Meat wants to slaughter horses. Then USDA backs away and they will not answer questions, they will not help us. I came on board in 2000, uh, May 2012, and we fought with them all summer to try to get the grant of inspection. They never would do it. They basically stonewalled. HSUS and others put a call out that this was gonna go on and that it needed to stop. They basically published Valley Meets information and said, these people are gonna do this horrible thing. We need to stop them. And so then they started having these threats in spring of 2012. Uh, I've had people call, leave me messages, uh, you know, that they will, you know, kill my kids, my grandkids, that I need to be where, where they sleep, that I need to know who's around me, what's around me. Well, uh, industrialized equine slaughter has not been something that New Mexicans have had a whole lot of experience with. When the slaughterhouse in Roswell first started making its proposals, that was something that was very distressful to us as New Mexicans. Again, I'd like for people to understand that, you know, I'm an agriculture attorney. And I, I grew up in the agriculture industry. And I think a lot of people in the agriculture industry understand where your food comes from. The process that's used in all 
European Union approved plants in North America, which currently is Canada and Mexico, but previously uh, were also used in the United States, is the captive bolt, bolt method of stunning the horse. The horse is uh, led into a chute, a kill box. Um, the horses have a uh, intense fear response to the smell of blood and to the sound of their uh, companions being slaughtered. The operator of the captive bolt gun, which is a pneumatic device which is intended to uh, hammer a steel rod into the brain of the horse and render it unconscious. The handler uh, essentially waves this pneumatic device over the head of the horse, attempting to hit the, the spot in the forehead, a very small spot about two inches wide uh, in the skull of the horse where the brain is located in order to render it unconscious. There is no way to humanely stun a horse in a slaughterhouse environment and render it unconscious for uh, slaughter for human consumption. When we slaughter cows, we put them in what we call a head restraint. The, the head can't move, okay? So we can be more accurate when we use the captive bolt or the pneumatic bolt, okay? We can be more accurate and hit it right in the center of the forehead so the bolt penetrates the brain, destroys the brain so the animal feels no pain. When you look at the cow's head, it's more uh, intact per se. So with the captive bolt, uh, when it penetrates the skull, it'll definitely hit the brain and destroy it. When you compare that to a horse, uh, you can't put it in a head restraint uh, because that anatomy compared to a cow's anatomy, uh, the, the horse neck is a lot longer, a lot muscular as compared to, to the cow's head. Valley Meat's goal for daily slaughter, even under these challenging conditions, is approximately 100 or more horses every day. So in other words, Mr. De Los Santos is going to slaughter 10 horses an hour. That is one horse every six minutes, and that's almost impossible to do. And my concern is actually that the line speed is going to be too fast, and the horses will not be stunned properly. Under the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act, it only calls for once to hit the animal and be accurate, that the bolt penetrates the skull, destroys the brain, so the animal cannot feel any pain. Then you can hoist the animal and then start the procedure, bleeding them out, you know, and uh, the rest of the uh, slaughter procedure. USDA will have two people at the plant every day that they're open. They cannot operate without USDA present at the plant. At these federal slaughter plants, there is no inspector or veterinarian stationed at the stunning box. USDA, when they set up the inspection, they have inspectors at the first inspection site is the head and tongue inspection site. We have an inspector there. The next time there's an inspector would be what we call the viscera. And then the last place we have an inspector is on the final rail where it's stamped USDA inspecting and pass. There is no inspector or veterinarian at the stunning box. Unfortunately, what happens is, and the plant knows this, uh, by the time that the animal's in the stunning box to the first inspection station, there's so much uh, equipment involved, you sometimes can't even see what's going on. And here there was violations all the time in the horse slaughter plants uh, before 2007, the two in Texas and the one in Illinois and USDA never shut them down, okay? So the horses suffered, they were in pain and agony all this time for all those years. I started getting lots of information sent to me. The next thing I was sent were these undercover videos for a facility in Quebec, uh, I always get the name wrong. I think it's La Nation de la Petite Viande.
Whether or not industrialized horse slaughter provides a humane end to a horse's life is subjective, since it depends on one's definition of humane. But a more objective debate on the subject has surfaced in recent years, one based on the concern over whether or not meat from American horses is safe for human consumption. Most animals slaughtered in USDA facilities here in the United States are animals which have been raised for human consumption. From birth to death, their lives are carefully monitored. Their food, environment, and any drugs administered to them are monitored and documented to ensure that they are fit for consumers. Since horses in the United States are not raised for human consumption, most horses which find themselves in the horse slaughter pipeline bring an unknown or undocumented medical history. Since 2009, records show that trainers at U.S. racing tracks have administered drugs to horses approximately 4,000 times. And there are over 100 drugs which have been detected in racehorses over the last decade. The most common drug administered to any kind of horse will be bute. And it's, it's basically the equivalent of, of, of us taking an aspirin. And you go around and, and ask any, any person if they've ever taken an aspirin, you'd be very hard to find somebody that says, no, I have never. And I think that's the same with butte, butte with horses. Um, so every horse has had it. And, and um, so, so I could go into lots of other drugs, whether they're steroid drugs or whether they're um, uh, worming drugs, various other things that are used commonly. But I only really ever focus on butte because butte is disallowed. Butte is, is ubiquitous. Um, in, in our world, and 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 to, to be honest, whether you you love horses or not, from a food safety standpoint, you, that should disqualify horses from the food chain. They're not food animals. That's that's a key differentiator of a horse to other livestock. Those in favor of horse slaughter argue that drugs are commonly given to other food-producing animals, and that a wait time is all that's required before the animal is fit for consumers. There is a high number of cattle that end up with drug residue also, and it's just like any other, any other animal. They're going to have drug residue in them. You've got to wait out the withdrawal time, and then it'll be safe to eat. It's the same with horses. That's the same type of deal. The butte question is a red herring. It's being used for the purpose of trying to stop the processing of horses. I'm not a scientist. I depend on a consensus scientific approach. And I have had people that deal with horses and deal with this issue, deal with veterinarians, that will explain to you what happens to butte. And nothing is left in that meat in 30 days. But the European Food Safety Authority and the European Medicines Agency have jointly stated that no maximum limits for phenylbutazone can be established and that the substance can therefore not be used in animals destined to enter the food chain. No acceptable withdrawal time is indicated. Butte does not have a withdrawal time. There is no amount of time. If they, if they knew amount of time, they would put it on the bucket, you know, withdraw for six months, but they don't. And, and the reason is that butte can be destructive at extremely, extremely low levels, way below detectability. The, the the butte issue is extremely serious. If it's mixed with other inflammatory drugs, it can be deadly. If it's mixed with some herbs, it can be deadly. And for uh, animals as well as humans, it causes kidney failure, it causes adrenal problems. It also, in some cases, can affect the marrow and bone. Back in the 70s, the Food and Drug Administration made the statement that horses are considered companion animals, not livestock. That is why on drugs used for horses, on the label says, not for human consumption.
Big Red turned out to be an example of how a horse with a history of butte can easily find his way into the food chain. Red happened to race in states which publish when a horse receives butte on race day. His records show multiple instances in which he received butte and also the drug Lasix, which is also banned in food animals. Although butte has no withdrawal time and is banned in food animals, Big Red was weighed, tagged, and bound for slaughter within days of being purchased by the kill buyer. No one checked his racing history to evaluate whether or not he would be safe for human consumption. While the cocktail of drugs often administered to racehorses gets significant attention in the safety debate, the discussion rarely includes wild horses, which also present an undocumented medical history, and one which can be equally dangerous. In racehorses, they have many drugs found in them, but in wild horses, they can also contract diseases that are public health significance. Toxoplasmosis is a disease that the horses picked up uh, while they're in the pasture. People got sick in Europe, and after being diagnosed, the doctors did find toxoplasmosis in them. After further research, they found out that the horses originated out of Canada, where they were slaughtered. There is a commercially viable market globally for horse meat. Right now, a lot of it's going to the Netherlands and France. Um, certainly China and, and the Asian markets are big places for this. That's a protein source. Companies from, from the Netherlands and from other places own horses on the ground, on feed in this country. They, that are then being shipped up to Canada or down to Mexico to be processed and then going from there into those markets. It is sometimes the case that European horses not raised for human consumption find their way to processing, but the European Union has regulations and procedures in place to evaluate such a horse's medical history. Yeah, in, in, in Europe, they, 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 they have a, a passport system um, for the horse. So when, when the horse um, receive some medication that that's supposed to be included in that passport and that passport stays with the horse through its lifetime um, and you know if, if the, the horse is unfortunate to, to end in a slaughter situation they, they should be able to check to make sure that the horse is qualified for slaughter um, that system is does not exist in North America the European Union has regulations about all import meat imports that are being consumed by consumers in those countries covered by the European Union. And in 2011, they implemented new, tougher regulations regarding the import from third countries, which includes all North American countries, of horse meat for human consumption. The equine identification document was meant to serve as a similar passport for North American horses processed in Canada and Mexico. But the results of its use have been questionable at best since it doesn't ask if horses have been administered prohibited drugs during their lifetime, as required by the European Food Safety Authority. It only asks if drugs have been administered over a period of the last six months. And that's assuming that the document is honestly completed. What they found in their audits is that quite often the EIDs, or equine identification documents, have been fraudulently completed by kill buyers who have just recently scooped these horses up at auctions, and there's no way that they can legitimately validate that the animals have not received the prohibited drugs within the prior six months. Any horse that comes from the United States and is shipped to either Canada or Mexico and presented for slaughter cannot reliably be expected to comply with European Union regulations. When the meat gets to Europe, it is tested, and we have never had a shipment of meat rejected in Europe from the United States because of contamination. Those opposed to horse slaughter also point out that in addition to the fears of consumer health and safety, there are unique environmental concerns when it comes to horse slaughter facilities. Well, 
We had a horse slaughter plant in Kaufman for about 27 years. The plant, it just, they couldn't seem to make them comply with the laws regarding their wastewater treatment, which was environmental regulations. There was blood literally in the streets. Partially treated wastewater was being discharged, and it was a serious concern for municipalities like Fort Worth that got their water from, from this water system. The slaughter plant had told the town of Kaufman in a public meeting that they were never going to put their blood into the sewers because fertilizer companies were interested in buying it, turning it into fertilizer. But the fertilizer companies said, we don't want to make blood meal out of tainted blood. And so the slaughter plant was not able to sell the blood, so they were putting it into the sewer system. And at one point, they used a pump to pump it down into the sewers, and it burst a main sewer line that was running through a residential community, and it backed up into people's bathtubs and toilets. They were constantly in violation of the wastewater treatment uh, permit. And if the town's wastewater treatment plant exceeded capacity three times, they were going to have to build an entirely new plant. So this was a huge economic problem for this town. They didn't have the economic wherewithal to go to court to fight the plant, which I think it had something like over 400 violations in 19 months. And they wanted separate jury trials for each violation. And it would have completely wiped out the town's budget. All the things that we did, eventually declaring them a nuisance, uh, we thought was going to be very useful because they were, their zoning was incorrect for their use. So if they were declared a nuisance, we could uh, either buy them out or if we could determine that they had made back their investment, just we could just close them. And so once they were declared a nuisance, we did subpoena their financial records. For example, their last tax uh, return, they had paid five dollars in federal income tax on twelve million dollars and that included by the way a fifty thousand dollar federal tax credit that you know the American taxpayers were funding this they basically were selling to themselves at a loss overseas those who have lived near horse slaughter facilities also cite the tempting lure of easy money which they say often leads to criminal behavior Criminality uh, permeates every nook and cranny of the horse slaughter industry. In 1998, uh, California outlawed horse slaughter. And in the next three years, uh, the number of horses stolen dropped. Realtors who sold horse properties would complain to me that they couldn't sell horse properties because of theft. We had beautiful savanna-like landscapes and, and uh, good horse properties at good prices, just 35 miles out of Dallas. And yet people didn't want to come work in Dallas and come home at night and find their horses stolen. And that was a fear, according to the realtors. One, I can just tell you anecdotally that one man had gone by there and seen that his horse was in the holding pen. He called them and said, you know, I'll be there first thing in the morning. Don't kill my horse. According to him, he picked up a deputy and the deputy went in, the head of him came back out and said, they killed your horse, this first horse they killed this morning. So yeah, I heard about this a lot. And often, as mayor, received phone calls from people all over the place whose horse had disappeared and they were terrified that it was there at the plant. When we're talking about processing horses, we're not talking about taking people's pets away from them. Those, those animals would still be with that person. Not necessarily, say some. Kill buyers are very good at dressing themselves up, bringing down the family, and acting like they want a horse for the backyard. They will seek out free horses. A lot of the horses that have been, let's say, on Craigslist, free to the right owner, from what I understand, have ended up going to slaughter. My name is Brittany Wallace. I'm 17 years old. And I'm here to tell my story about my horse scribbles. And I owned her since I was nine years old. She was my first horse and she taught me everything I know. She taught me how to ride. She brought me to competitions, won me a number of awards. When I outgrew her, I sold her to what I thought was a very loving home that was supposed to keep her forever. And months later, Kelly Smith from Omega Horse Rescue found her at a slaughter auction in New Holland, Pennsylvania in a kill pen. She 
posted a picture of her on Facebook and I have her back now and there still is nothing wrong with her. She's a perfectly useful horse. She's an amazing mare. I went to go visit her when I got her back at Kelly's rescue and and she started licking me and it was just like she knew. She knew how close she was to dying and she knew how lucky she was. Scribbles became part of an underground and deceptive series of exchanges, which some say is far more likely to occur when horse slaughter is present, and especially in communities where processing facilities exist. The correlation between slaughter and abuse and neglect is not a negative one. They say it's, it's a negative one. If we slaughter more, we'll have less abuse and neglect. You know, it's a, it's a negative number. If we slaughter less, we'll have more abuse and neglect. And it's not true. The, the, the data shows that when slaughter goes up, abuse and neglect goes up. The, when Kaufman plant was closed down, that was the Dallas Crown plant in Kaufman, Texas, and it was closed in 2007, the crime index uh, dropped you know, about uh, 75%. Eighty percent of Americans think that horses should not be slaughtered for human consumption. That's our culture. That's our belief. Well, who took the poll? Uh, you know, you go you go out on the street and ask, should horses be processed and eaten? Yeah, eighty percent are going to say no, unless you explain the rest of the, the story to them. The rest of the story is. What are we going to do with three or 400,000 surplus horses, unwanted horses, no place to go? What are you going to do with them? Um, certainly people in the agriculture industry have, have uh, I want to call it more of a comfortableness with uh, using animals for food and what that process entails. We have a, a, an issue of range devastation and an issue of unwanted horses with nowhere to go because there is no end uh, market for them being dumped and left to starvation and neglect. Um, they saw, and I think they still see, horse slaughter as a, a solution to a problem, which is hundreds of thousands of unwanted horses and no real care for those horses before that. Critics contest these figures. While the BLM's annual calculations claim 58,150 horses and burrows on their management areas, there are no reliable calculations for horses on other territories. Instead, a combined number is estimated, often referred to as unwanted horses, and based on the number of horses which go to slaughter each year. These numbers are based on a for-profit, foreign-driven industry. So we're saying, oh, we have 150,000 unwanted horses in our country. And we're not, the pro-slaughter advocates are saying that, when in fact, every single one of these horses is driving um, a financial gain at the end. Prove it. I would love to have hearings in the United States Congress and have people that can actually testify as to the validity of that statement or what I'm saying. If this other side is right, then there is no need for any processing of wild horses. My simple question to them then is, why do we have 39,000 of those animals on ranches around the country? Many of those claiming a large unwanted horse population also apply the term to privately owned horses and assert that horse-related industries need a means to dispose of their surplus horses. One of their big arguments is if you don't kill them, they're going to be abused and neglected because people are just going to abandon them. And they love to use the, uh, the old horse whose owners can no longer support it. You know, he's 18 years old and, the, and, and Ma and Pa Kettle can't support him anymore. That's not the horse that goes to slaughter. In fact, the horse that goes to slaughter is often very young, frequently under the age of five. When I heard that there was a baby in the kill pen, I really thought it was an anomaly. And I've since found out that this happens all the time and in fact, it's that meat is more in demand. And I, I don't really fully understand it, but there are very, very many babies going to slaughter. Baiting Hollow Farm and Horse Rescue is currently home to nearly 30 horses, most of them rescued from the fate of the slaughterhouse. More than half the horses are standard breads, thoroughbreds, or quarter horses from the racetrack. 
some of them boasting pedigrees from world-famous racehorses such as Man of War, War Admiral, and Secretariat. All but a few were under five at the time of rescue, and the organization's first rescue was Angel, rescued at the age of one and a half, straight from the kill pen. I think uh, many of them put forth this argument that, well, you know, if, if we don't have slaughter, then our old horses are going to be put out to, to starve. The fact is, the slaughter industry doesn't take old sick horses, but the cattlemen thought this would be an effective argument to get people, uh, the public, to um, accept slaughterhouses in their communities as some kind of humane uh, disposal place for horses that would otherwise suffer in the field. And it was really um, very much a, an untruthful claim on their part. What they are is sport horses. Most of them came right straight from a track, right straight from the rodeo. And they've, they've been there for two years, maybe three years. They no longer winning or they never were very good. And they're sold to slaughter and they get a new one and they, the dreams of a, of a big win start over again. In fact, the USDA reports that over 90% of the horses arriving at slaughter plants are in good condition and appropriate for adoption. These are healthy horses, but while they may have been healthy, they might not have been profitable. The Humane Society of the United States is not against the breeding of horses. In fact, we encourage and admire those who bring good quality animals into the world for the enjoyment of the American public. The people who are breeding too many animals and creating a glut of surplus animals for which they have no plan and feeding the horse slaughter pipeline is essentially perpetuating a vicious cycle which is never going to end as long as horse slaughter is around. What gives anyone the right to say to the American Quarter Horse Association and their members, you are breeding too many horses? It is not a humane issue versus inhumane issue. It's a private property right issue. You take away processing, there's no salvage value. You've got a horse, you buy that horse, you know that all it's going to be for the rest of its life is a cost. There is never a salvage value. Now the horse owners, many of them thoroughbred, others are, you know, it's the horse becomes part of the family. I understand that. And they wouldn't think of having that horse processed for human consumption. But there are many in the working side of this that need the income. They need the 500 or 600 or $700 for that animal because they don't have the attachment with that animal anymore with that horse than they did with a cow that they raised or a pig or a lamb or a chicken. And there is the biggest reason why the debate over horse slaughter rages on. While many in the country view horses as pets and members of the family, many others view the animal as livestock. Even our federal government classifies the horse as livestock, largely for tax purposes. That's where you have to start your, you know, your questioning. Who's making money off of this? Now, if you want to make horses pets, like dogs, remember, pets are not tax deductible. And when you look at the importance of taxing, how we treat livestock regarding tax laws, you can deduct your expenses from your income. Horse racing, rodeos, all are businesses and run like businesses and need to be treated like businesses. If you make horses pets, why should Congress have any tax consideration for the horse industry? Classifying the horse as livestock may be good for business, but it means that the horse may never enjoy the same protections that we afford to our domestic animals and pets. Uh, I know, I, I know myself, the majority, overwhelming majority of horse owners would be very supportive of processing for human consumption. Well, I've always loved uh, horses. The Lone Ranger was my hero. But I've always loved the horse. I think the horse is a companion. Uh, and when I learned that a horse slaughtering facility was going to open in my state, and I no longer was governor, I'm still a citizen, I felt I had to do something. It's mainly a federal issue, because what you want is a federal prohibition that uh, 
takes over the laws of all states. So failing to have a federal law to have prohibitions, you want to go state by state. And unfortunately, some of the Western states where some of the slaughtering might be happening, there's some either very weak laws or unwilling politicians to take a stand. The only thing that's keeping them at bay right now is that we have so-called defunding language that they can't have the anti-mortem inspection, the before death inspection funded by the USDA. So that's what's keeping them from, from moving forward at this point. The defunding language can serve as a temporary measure to prevent facilities from opening in the United States. But it is only temporary and must be renewed each fiscal year when Congress appropriates its federal dollars. And it still does not prevent horses from crossing the border into Canada or Mexico for slaughter. If they find some wrinkle that allows it, then we're back to that. So we really do need somehow both the the total federal ban on horse slaughter in the United States and the export for slaughter. That's all that we need. And in every way, horse slaughter is a, a terrible burden for American taxpayers, for horse owners, and for horses. I didn't write the laws. I, I am trying to do a legal business to make a living, to provide jobs, to provide a service. And I don't think that's out of line. I really don't. Why are they coming to me? Go to Congress, go to President Obama, go change the law. In the last two decades, dozens of similar laws have been proposed at the federal level. Up until now, all have failed. But I think the campaign in America has to be twofold. Ban slaughtering horses in the United States, but also ban the export. We've been working for years to try to bring about a ban on the slaughter domestically here in the United States of horses, as well as their transport for slaughter to Canada and Mexico for human consumption. The Safeguard American Food Exports Act um, underlines the fact that horses are not raised for human consumption. They are treated with drugs that are prohibited for use in food producing animals, both here in the United States by our own FDA and in Europe, the European Union, um, for animals raised there for human consumption. I was part of a group that was looking into the question of doping of horses related to the horse racing industry. It was an, area, an issue brought to our attention from some jockeys uh, who are well known and uh, well regarded as well as responsible trainers uh, and horse owners who have seen some of the problems associated in the industry, a story covered extensively in the New York Times. Um, there are a number of bills that deal with the uh, mistreatment of horses that are starting to move. I think this can be one of them. Um, it would um, it prohibit the transfer of horses, parts of horses, horse meat um, from the, the United States. It would essentially put an end to, to horse slaughter or anyone knowingly being engaged in moving horses for the purpose of, of slaughter for human consumption. The only way to prevent horses from the United States from meeting this end is to pass legislation to ban the slaughter of horses here and abroad. The Safeguard American Foods Export Act received support from more than 200 members of Congress but there are many others who oppose the bill. The public needs to understand that there are forces that want to reinstate horse slaughter. There are some members of Congress who are very beholden to the agriculture industry and have been sent a clear message that the ag industry wants horse slaughter to resume. What happens? You know, the dairymen uh, and the, uh, uh, the cattlemen start sending money in. And pretty soon you've got some pretty powerful lobbyists against you. Again, I come back, this is a private property right issue that has been taken away. And that's why I think the new Congress uh, is going to be much more sensitive to private property rights. I believe that it's very possible with the right champion in the Congress that this issue will come forward and we'll actually have a vote of the Congress. At, at worst, it's going to be a close vote. At best, I think our side will win. 
If it's the sentiment of the country that they don't want to do this, that's fine, but you need to have a solution. In New Mexico, for instance, um, one of the common numbers we hear, hear is more than 100,000 horses in this state that, that are abandoned, that are starving. Um, if you were to feed, let's say, 100,000 horses for a year on fairly on the cheap and not do a lot to take care of them, you're roughly $2,000 per horse. $2,000 per horse times 100,000 horses is $200 million a year just for the state of New Mexico. I don't know that we have the money to do that. Feeding horses and hundreds of thousands of horses to the tunes of hundreds of millions of dollars a year, I just don't see how the, it makes sense for Congress to pass a law that has that kind of unintended consequence. Managing wild horses on large masses of land certainly presents different logistical problems. There's obstacles, but they're all resolvable. There's many solutions. We can manage four to six million cows on our public lands, on millions of acres, year after year, branding them, loading them, sorting them, bringing them back out, going back to a home ranch, bringing them to the kill lot or the feed lot. We can manage some, you know, 37,000 wild horses out on our public lands. Let's focus on the solutions to the wild horse and burrow and mustang. And the solutions are sanctuaries for them. The solutions are population control, what are called triages, where they can live properly. In the spring of 2014, the Foundation to Protect New Mexico Wildlife formed an agreement with the Navajo Nation, establishing a memorandum of understanding that the Foundation agrees to provide services to the tribe to help them manage any surplus horse populations. is that the foundation and other horse advocates are going to help us plan a different methodology to managing the horse population. We will have a new direction to go toward. One of the most successful options in managing the nation's wild horse population is the implementation and support of wild horse sanctuaries. There are many such sanctuaries throughout the country. Return to Freedom on the California coast near Santa Barbara is one of them. I, first of all, was amazed that there were still wild horses in America. I think that's what most Americans feel. And then secondly, I was just devastated to see what was happening to them. There is a way to manage the wild horse in healthy, viable herds for generations to come. That's what we all want. And I think that it's very reasonable to discuss solutions that are viable, that make sense, and that are a lot more affordable than the current management program. Solutions that don't in involve cruelty, suffering, abuse, slaughter, the solutions are there. We can do it. Many approaches are used to maintain the healthy lives of the sanctuary's 400 horses, which remain in natural family bands and live their lives much as they would in the wild. We have a birth control program here that we've been using uh, for about 14 years. We use native PZP, it's a vaccine for the mares. We dart the mares once a year. The mares are healthy, mares are living 10 years longer because they're not foaling year after year in the harsh climates. It's uh, reversible, it's non-hormonal, and it seems like the least invasive thing that we could find uh, to control our population at the sanctuary. Recently, the National Academy of Science did a report and they actually agreed uh, with this type of philosophy, stating that this would save millions of dollars. The long term would save money and it would end this endless cycle of abuse, of fear, of trauma and waste that is just continuing in a never ending cycle. Well, it would be BLM's long-term goal to reduce gathers and removals of animals. It would be ideal if we could match births with deaths on the range through fertility control methods. Everything would be balanced and we wouldn't have to conduct the removals. That would be ideal. 
Similar endeavors to handle the surplus horse population stemming from horse-related industries have also been implemented in recent years to great success. The horse racing industry um, has recognized that it has a problem with what happens to horses after they finish their racing careers. And various racetracks have policies now where if horses are found going to slaughter that ran at the racetrack, there are repercussions to those, the connections of the, the horse, whether it's the owners or, or the trainer. But it's not yet enough. Um, so there are still horses going to slaughter. Um, and we still need to do more work and we still need to be more transparent about a bunch of stuff that we do. And we, we need to do a better job of getting rid of the bad actors in the industry. Um, but um, but to, to say that we're completely innocent of this stuff is, is ridiculous. Um, but to, to label us as being the reason why horse slaughter exists is also ridiculous. My experience is more with the racing industry. The people that I know in the racing industry are starting to really wake up. Many of these people do not want this anymore. Originally a farm and vineyard, in 2007, the owners of Baiting Hollow began rescuing horses from the fate of the kill pen. Today, the organization gives dozens of these animals a safe haven in which to live out the rest of their lives. Uh, whenever we get a new horse that comes in, uh, if they are um, abused or something like that, I try to work with them, approach with them slowly, uh, try to get them back to uh, trusting people. We have one horse, our Pasifino Tango, um, who was in someone's backyard for 11 years. He was never gelded. He was never trained. I took one look at him, I said, he'll go to auction. He's going right to slaughter. There is nobody that's gonna step in for this stallion and rescue him. So those are the kinds of horses we take, the ones that, that don't really have the chance. Right now he's 13 years old and he's a really excellent, excellent riding horse. Still a challenge, still not a people person, but he's, he's getting there. But when you put that bit on him and you get on him, he likes to ride. And so that's some protection for him anyway. But we've really come to take those that desperately need that training because I think um, that's probably why they don't get rescued at the last second. Collectively, organizations like Baiting Hollow rescue hundreds if not thousands of horses every year, giving these animals a second chance at life. Big Red turned out to be one of those horses. Here he is today. Just hours before he was scheduled to ship to Mexico for slaughter, the Foxy G Foundation, a horse rescue organization in Maryland, was contacted. They paid the kill buyer directly to save Big Red's life and brought him to their foundation for rehabilitation. Big Red, was almost a toxic meal for someone overseas. Now, instead, he'll enjoy spending some time with his companions under the protection of Foxy G's retirement program. And he might even someday be adopted into a new home. This is, this is not about um, an old sick horse. Um, being euthanized. So that's not what it's about. This is about business. This is about making money. I mean, you eat what you want to eat. And I don't think people ought to be telling me what to eat. It's a global problem. It's a problem for everyone. No one should eat tainted meat. There has to be, you know, a moral character behind a country and its people. We are not a culture that eats dogs or cats. We should not be eating our horses. I didn't write the laws. I, I am trying to do a legal business to make a living. I don't want to hear that it's just business. I mean, everything's about business. Everything's about money. But you have to draw the line. Money does alter people's view of what's acceptable and what's real. Our animal kingdom, our, uh, our horses, our dogs, cats, and I think they're creatures that are part of humanity. Uh, they're companions. Uh, if they hear that in the United States we ban the slaughterhouse 
and banned horse slaughtering, uh, I believe it would have an effect of generalizing and pushing for grassroots efforts to stop horse slaughtering in Mexico. I really do believe this, that on some level, the choices that we make today are very critical. And I think by making humane, ethical, responsible choices for our wildlife, our natural resources, uh, our wild horses, our domestic animals, I think it's going to create a better humanity. hitters in the horse industry that are, that are talking to the Congress saying, no, we're not going to continue to allow you to destroy the industry by putting these bans in place. One thing you won't see is a permanent ban, and that's just not there. 